Oh, man. Just while you're standing, while you're standing, don't sit down. Don't sit down. If you're already seated, whatever, that's fine. I will tell you this, though, all joking aside, and I think I have dreadlocks in my mouth. Um, you know this, it's not the hair. It's the heart. It's the heart. I know Todd is already uh, traveling this morning, but I just sat there watching him last night, and I've known this about him for a while. It, it's, it's not the hair, it's the heart, and specifically, it's the tenderness of heart. And a lot of people watch his ministry or ministries like that one, and they, they see the power in it, and they're in awe of the power and the strength, and it's an awesome thing to watch. But uh, you got to know where that comes from. And the thing that touches me so much about his ministry and ones like that is the tenderness of heart. Did you notice last night as he was ministering how easily tears came? I'm going to tell you something, men. That's not because he's an emotional person. It's not what that's about at all. He has a tender heart. A tender heart. And this, honestly, above all is what the Lord is looking for. Sadly, it's, um, it's not something that's often used to describe us as men, but it should be a major defining characteristic of born again men, Amen. men of God, the tenderness of heart. When, when Jesus corrected people and he had some of the strongest words to say to certain individuals, if you go back and look through the scriptures over and over and over again, it was about the hardness of their heart. He was going to heal somebody on a Sabbath and he looked around to the, to the Pharisees and religious people that were there and he said, is it lawful, is it right to heal on the Sabbath or to destroy? I mean, it's a simple question, right? And it should have a simple answer. But the Bible says they kept silent and it tells us Jesus looking around at them was angry, angry at the hardness of their heart. Unresponsive. They kept silent. They didn't say a thing. A hard heart is an unresponsive heart. You remember the day shortly after Jesus had been raised from the dead and the disciples were all gathered together and he had already revealed himself to the women at the tomb. He'd already revealed himself to the two that were walking the road to Emmaus. And both of them came back and gave reports to Peter and the guys and said, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive. And they didn't believe him. Jesus had told them what was going to happen and they still didn't believe it. And you remember when Jesus came in the room that day, he didn't use the door. He just came walking through the wall. I think we have it in our heads. It was some sort of sweet reunion. Hey, guess who's got two thumbs and just raised from the dead? This guy, what's up? But I tell you this, it was not hugs and high fives. He came in and the Bible says he rebuked them. That's good. That's a greeting. He rebuked them for the hardness of their heart because they did not believe. You want to you know what has the power of God turned up in Todd's ministry and others just like that? Tenderness. Tenderness of heart. And a tender heart. You ever had a tender place somewhere? Huh? You started working out. You hadn't worked out since you were 18 and, and you thought, well, it's been 40 years. I should give it another shot. And you started working out again and you got a trainer like mine who likes to start with leg day. And he's not nice about it. He might actually be in here this morning. Where are you at, bro? And you start on leg day and you're deadlifting and you're back squatting. And how many of you know a couple of days from now, you're going to be tender, Right? And if somebody even so much as just gives you a little pat, oh, dear God, don't touch me, it hurts. Responsive. A tender place is responsive. Well, a tender heart is responsive. A tender heart is quick. Quick to believe. Quick to believe. So if you've sat in here 
over the last couple of days and you're wrestling with the doctrinal things you've heard and you're, you're, you're tangled up in the questions that these messages pose and how do we really know that there is a God and how do we really know that Jesus is any more than a historical figure? I'm sorry, I just have a superior intellect and I, I like to question things and I have to investigate things and it, it just re really reveals how I think. No, it tells us what's going on in your heart. It's hard. It's hard. But a tender heart is quick to believe. Quick to receive. Can I tell you one more thing that a tender heart is? Quick to repent. Do you want to know what saved David's life? Because he messed up in big ways. And when the prophet came to him and told that story of the man who had stolen the other man's sheep and David gets all fired up and tell me who it is and I'll kill him. And the prophet said, it's you, bro. <laughs> instead of standing there fighting, instead of standing there making excuses, instead of standing there saying, I'm a man, I can't help it. I've got certain feelings. I've got certain needs. Instead of offering up any of that, instead of saying, well, you know, I, I do have an issue. Well, I'm not the only one. You ever heard anybody say this? I'm not perfect. And then usually they'll say after that, nobody's perfect. See how quiet it is? Yeah, some of you said it this morning. <laughs> There's a couple of problems with that. Number one, somebody is perfect. Somebody is perfect. And somebody has put their perfection inside your heart. So don't ever use that as a cop out again. Somebody is perfect. Jesus, who is perfect, said to us, the disciple will never be above his master. But if he's perfect, that word means complete. He'll be like his master. So instead of offering up any of those excuses, you know what David did? Right then and there he hit his knees and he cried out to God. Somebody say tender. tender. Saved his life. Saved his family. Saved his kingdom. Because he was quick to repent. I know a lot of people wrestle with that. Are we New Testament believers? Are we supposed to repent? What do we, I don't get it. This dispensation of grace. Are we supposed to repent? I'll let you study that, but I recommend you check out the book of Revelation where Jesus goes walking through the churches and says to whole churches, y'all need to repent. So you check it out and decide. But all repentance is, guys, is honesty. It's just honesty. It's just being done playing games, being done faking this thing. It's just being honest. And you cannot have intimacy without honesty. Intimacy is built on honesty. Well, I just feel like my sin has put such a wall between me and God. Sin can't do that anymore. The only thing, listen to me, the only thing that can put a wall between you and God, it's not the sin, it's you lying about it. It's you being dishonest about it. And not calling it what it is. And as long as you'll be honest, you can have intimacy with God. Just honesty. Oh, Lord, you call that thing sin? That's what I call it. That's why the Bible says confess it. The word confess literally means to say the same thing as. So if he calls that thing sin, well, that's what I call it too. You don't like it? I don't like it. Yeah, I know I did it 3,000 times, but I don't like it. I hate it because you hate it. I love what you love. Just being honest with him. Innis, uh, intimacy is built on honesty. I'm talking to you about your relationship with God, but this applies to your relationship with your wife. Amen. Your intimacy is built on your honesty. A tender heart is quick. Somebody say quick. Quick, quick to what? Believe. Quick to receive. Quick to repent. 
Before you sit down, I want to show you one scripture, and then we're going to pray over this together. I believe the Lord instructed me to show this to you. And, this, and I'm going to put this on the screen for you guys. If you'll put up there Second Chronicles for me, chapter 34. There's a story in the Old Testament about King Josiah, who was a godly man, had a heart for God. And they came to him one day, and they said, King, we have found the book of the law. We found the word of God. That's all they had as the word. We found it. It was, it was missing. Somebody lost the Bible, <laughs> like the one. And they began reading it to him. And he began hearing for the first time the word of the Lord. And the Bible says he tore his clothes as a sign of repentance because he saw in the word, your people, O oh Lord, have not been doing what you said to do. And he also saw the judgment that came as the result of it. So he repented and he sent those guys who read the word to him. He said, you go to the prophetess and you find out what's going to happen to us. This is serious to him. Tore his clothes, put on sackcloth. And they went to her and she said, yeah, the word of the Lord will come to pass. He is just, he has spoken it and this is what will happen. But he, uh, the prophet has said to him, put this up there for us, please. Second Chronicles 34, uh, verse 26. Let's see what that says. This is the word of the Lord to the king. But as for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord in this manner, you shall speak to him. Thus says the Lord God of Israel concerning the words which you have heard, because your heart was tender. Because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before God when you heard his words against this place and against his inhabitants and you humbled yourself before me and you tore your clothes and you wept before me. I also have heard you, says the Lord. Surely I will gather you to your fathers and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace and your eyes will not see the calamity, calamity which I will bring on this place and its inhabitants. So they brought back word to the king. What saved this man's life? God was willing to totally reverse course on coming judgment. And he spared this man because of his tender heart. Now, I know we, we have to read this through the eyes of our covenant. And that's not my message today. But the point remains, it is a New Testament concept that your heart be tender. Tenderness saved his life. And I was thinking about Todd, you know, wore that stupid wig, but I wore it in honor of him. <laughs> Hope you and he can receive it that way. <laughs> but I, listening to his testimony last night, I realized something. That man had done enough natural harm to his body to put him on a quick road to, to destruction. I know Todd would say this, he should have been dead a long time ago. <laughs> but his heart was tender. His heart was tender. And I heard these words in my spirit, and if he was here, I'd say it to him, but I'm gonna say it to anybody else who identifies with that testimony. It's almost as though the Lord, what he said to the king, he would say to you, all the damage that the drinking has done I'm reversing that because your heart was tender. All the damage that the drugs have done to your organs, to your brain, I'm reversing all that because your heart was tender. Can we lift our hands right now? And just tell the Lord this is what we desire because we see it's what He desires, a tender heart. Before we go any further, I want you just to take stock just for a moment and ask yourself, if somebody asked my wife or the people in my life, my family, is he tender, what would the answer be? Not asking you, asking the people who actually know. And if the answer's been no, well, let's get it right. We saw yesterday in the scripture where God gave Saul another heart. 
He could do the same for you. Father, we just tenderize ourselves right now in your presence, in this holy place where you have already done such wonderful things, such miraculous things. The momentum just in the last 48 hours or less has built to the place where what happened at this altar, the freedom that took place here and the deliverance and the healing, all the glory goes to you, Lord. And Father, so that you are able to further use us more in the future, in the coming days, we make our hearts tender before you. I refuse to believe the lie the world tells that a man has got to be hard in his heart. I don't have to be hard in my heart. I don't have to be unresponsive, unfeeling. Say it and say it by faith if you have to. My heart is tender. Tender to the voice of my good shepherd. I hear his voice. He can speak softly to me. And I'll hear it. I'll be quick to obey. Quick to yield. Because my heart is tender. Quick to believe. Lord, whatever I see in your word, I am quick to believe it. Put it into practice. I am quick to receive. I am quick to repent. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. What a good word we heard yesterday, the, the, the revelation that that sin has not stained your spirit, that sin has not penetrated the seal of the Holy Ghost on the inside of you. But who wants it in any part of their life? Quick, quick, quick. Quick to repent. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, glory to God. That's him, guys. That's him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, he's so merciful. He's so merciful. He's so merciful. He's so merciful. Now you know what it means when you read in the scripture that Jesus, our high priest, says we do not have a high priest who is not easily touched by what we're going through. That's tenderness. Easily touched. Thank you. Easily touched. Hey, Rhett, man, I, you caught my eye this morning and the word of the Lord came to me for you. You did a good thing when you led your family here. And I know it wasn't an easy thing, said the Lord, but you did hear from me. And I want you to know that in that simple step and act of obedience, to follow the leadership of my spirit, you saved your family. Man, I saw, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I saw, I saw it so clear. The enemy had been working for years to orchestrate something. And I think it was an attack on the kids, man. And this step of obedience, oh, thank you have saved their lives. You've saved your marriage. As far as I know, it was good then. 
But you're in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing with the right people. And I believe the Lord wanted to highlight that in you, not to draw attention just to you, but as an example, because this room was full of men who have made the same decision. Brother, am I telling the truth? The Lord did this for you and your wife. This is my brother-in-law and he and his wife had a decision to make when we moved our ministry here. And they were praying, do we stay, do we go? And the Lord dealt with them strongly, you need to go. And after you got here, he told you, you saved your family. It's tenderness, guys, tenderness. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Be tender to follow. Oh, thank you, Lord. Do you love the presence of the Lord? Along for these times. Father, we lift our hands right now in worship and in praise and thank you for your presence that's so strong and rich, not only in us, but on us right now, in manifestation in this room. Hallelujah. Lord, we come before your word just for these next few moments. We open up our eyes to see and our ears to hear. We open up our hearts, our tender hearts, to be receptive and understand more of who we are in Jesus and who Jesus is in us. We're leaving this place today with revelation. We're leaving this place today with understanding that's changing our lives. Glory, glory to God. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. amen. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Be seated. Whew. Thank you, Lord. That's what I've been looking for. Thank you, Lord. Well, are you full or can you eat just a little more? How many of you wear sweatpants to the Thanksgiving table? Just because just you know what you're about to do. Well, I hope you wore your stretchy pants today, guys. We have been filled so full of truth and the word. But somebody say, I'm hungry. I'm hungry, I'm hungry. And Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because you're gonna be filled with it. And I guess the flip side of that is if you're not hungry, it's because you're already full of something else. You get hungry for this though, he'll fill you with Righteousness, who you are in him. Thank you, Lord. Okay, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Are you still holding your place there? Good, 2 Timothy chapter 3. I think we can actually get to it. I want to continue to build on what we left off with yesterday. Concerning the anointing. I am, you are, a man anointed. Say it again. I am, I am. a man anointed. Now, before we go any further, I just have to ask, did that wig destroy what's going on up here today? Are we okay? Justice, am I okay? <laughs> My son says, eh, okay. <laughs> Good enough. A man anointed. And we understand the anointing, if you've ever heard it taught. Um, you can draw a definition from places like Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27, that says, the burden shall be removed and the yoke shall be destroyed from off thy neck because of the anointing. So if you're looking for a definition of the anointing, you could say it is the burden removing, yoke destroying power of God. And subsequently, it's the reason Satan is terrified of it. It's the reason he hates the anointing. It's because he is in the burden building business. He is the, the head of the the Better Burden Bureau, the, the Bigger Better Burden Bureau. That's his whole game. That's been his whole thing with humanity from day one. It's to build and install a burden and a yoke around the necks of mankind that they live burdened and lived yoked to the point where they don't even know it. They just call it life. They live yoked with sickness. They live yoked with, with um, uh, insecurity and depression. 
They live yoked with things and, and no, I have this because daddy had this and daddy's daddy had this and daddy's daddy's daddy had this and they just call it living. And Satan will and has worked for generation after generation after generation in the lives of families, in the lives of communities, in the lives of whole people groups to build such a burden onto them that they don't even recognize they're burdened by him. They just think it's life. And the reason he hates the anointing is because after a century of building this burden, one second under the anointing can break the whole thing. Destroy that whole yoke. Leaves him going, what'd you do to my burden? What happened to my yoke? The anointing destroyed it. The anointing did it. So the anointing is the burden removing, yoke destroying power of God. And it's what we see in action in Jesus' ministry. When he stood up and he found the place in the book of Isaiah and he read, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has shouted out, anointed me. Now notice he didn't stop there. The anointing is always for something. It's not just so that you or I could say, I'm anointed. Yeah, me too. I'm anointed. No, it's always for something. It's always to something. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. What does that tell you? Right there. Poverty is a burden and a yoke. Jesus was and is anointed to lift that burden and destroy that yoke. Poverty, in whatever degree you're talking about it in, is not a blessing not a blessing in disguise. So don't lie about it anymore. Call it what it is. Poverty is a burden. Poverty is a yoke. And Jesus was anointed to preach the gospel, to lift that burden and destroy that yoke. He said, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to heal the brokenhearted. Brokenheartedness is not a gift from God. It's not a blessing. It's not a part of the mysterious plan God has for your life. It's a burden. It's a yoke. And Jesus was and is anointed to lift that burden and destroy that yoke. The Spirit of the Lord's upon me. He's anointed me. Preach the gospel to the poor. Heal the brokenhearted. Open the blind eyes. And we see it in his ministry. Eyes being opened. Blindness is not a blessing. And the only thing I can think of that would be worse than natural blindness, you know what it is? Spiritual blindness. This is why the Spirit of God prayed through Paul that the eyes of our understanding, the eyes of our heart would be opened and flooded with light because blindness is a burden. Blindness is a yoke. And Jesus is anointed to lift that burden and destroy that yoke. Glory to God. But here's what I want you to see over the next 21 minutes and 15 seconds. You and I are not only recipients of that anointing, we're carriers of it. And this is where we lose a lot of people right here. You, could, you probably wouldn't be able to find one person in the global body of Christ that would disagree with you if you were to say, Jesus is anointed. Oh, yes, of course, Christ, it's what the word means, the anointed one. Jesus is anointed. Here's where the group gets a lot smaller. Are you ready? And so am I. Oh, uh, I don't know. That's heresy, blasphemy. Truth. Paul said, God, who has established us in Christ with you, has anointed us. Anointed us. You and I are not just receivers, recipients of that anointing. We're carriers of it. Carriers of it. Now, when Jesus listed all those things in Luke chapter 4, uh, preaching to the poor, healing the brokenhearted, opening the eyes of the blind, declaring liberty to the captives, setting free those who were oppressed, preaching the acceptable year of the Lord, which is debt freedom and freedom from slavery, when he said, I'm anointed to preach these things to these people, he was describing the entire human race. He wasn't saying, I'm anointed to preach the gospel to certain people who, who are under a certain income level. That doesn't make sense. No, he's saying, unless and until you have him, who cares what you've got in the bank? You could be loaded with cash. 
You don't have him. You're a poor man with money. He's describing all of humanity. Before you knew him, you were poor, brokenhearted, blind, oppressed, and imprisoned. That was you. Somebody say, that was me. And that is you unless and until you call on him and you become a receiver of that anointing. And then that anointing is present to lift every one of those burdens and destroy those yokes. Amen? Amen. Now take it a step further. You've become a receiver of it. Now you're a carrier of it. (sighs) Glory to God. So we understand now that the anointing is that burden removing yoke destroying power. But I'm going to give you one more word to associate with it. Okay. And this is what we find here in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that's taken us two days to get to. Paul writing to Timothy in verse 16, this is important, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16, put that up there for us if you would. Don't these guys do an amazing job with these scriptures on the street? I tell you what, brother Andrew is a walking New Testament and he just knows these verses and they flow with them. I just appreciate that guys. Thank you so much. That is, it's such a blessing in a meeting like this. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Somebody read those two uh, first words out loud with me. All Scripture. So how much of the Scripture are we talking about? All. All of it. Is it important that we make note of this in 2024? Have you heard anybody say anything in recent days or try to, try to allude to, we don't, there's certain portions of Scripture you know, we don't need? Be careful. He said all scripture. And when he said all scripture, what he was saying was not yet scripture. There was no such thing as a New Testament. Which all scripture was he talking about? All of it. Now, yes, we do need to, when we read what is called the Old Testament. Yes, you need to read it through the lens and the understanding of what has happened through Jesus, but don't you dare go ripping out words from God. There's not one of us in here, I don't care how many years you went to medical school, nobody in here is qualified to perform a scripture ectomy. Not one of us. He said all scripture. All scripture is what? Is given by God for inspir or it's given by inspiration of God and is profitable. One translation says useful for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. How many times have we heard about our righteousness the last few days? You're beginning to understand more now than you ever have before. You are the righteousness of God in Christ, but you still need some instruction in it. I am the righteousness of God. Now teach me how to walk that. We need that. And he said the word of God, the scripture is profitable. It's useful in these. He gave you four things here. He talked about doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. Did you notice two out of the four, 50% here of what the word of God has given us for is correction, reproof, correction, rebuking, and correcting. Well, what's the difference between rebuking and correcting? Rebuking is correcting with volume. Rebuking is correcting when the correcting didn't work. Did I lose you? 50% of what the Word of God is supposed to be doing in the life of the man of God is bringing correction. Well, think about the word itself, correction. Correction, we've thought it to be somebody telling you you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. And there is an element of that in that, but it's not complete. If all you're doing as the head of your house is telling your children they're wrong all the time, you are not correcting. You're condemning. Correction includes saying what is correct, not just what's wrong, what's right, and then demonstrating it. This is a complete correction. 
And too often we fall back on that, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong. And this is why people, by and large, in our culture are so keenly and acutely aware all the time of what's wrong with them. Have you noticed this? Social media has become a platform for people to preach what's wrong. And they will tell millions of people who didn't ask. This is what's wrong. This is what's wrong with me. This is what's wrong with you. This is what's wrong with the president. This is what's wrong with the government. This is what's wrong with this and them and that. And this is what's wrong with Andrew. And this is what's wrong with Kenneth. And this is, did I hit too close to home? We're seeing it, social media and the ability to post whatever stupid thing comes across your brain has affected this culture. And people will talk all the time, what's wrong? You say to somebody, hey, what's going on? Everything okay, what's wrong? And get ready, because they're about to launch into a list of everything that's wrong. I heard a guy one time say, he's a comedian, he went to a doctor, and he was in the doctor's office. Doctor comes in, he says, well, what brings you in today? And he looked at the doctor, and this guy, he was talking about getting, getting older, you know, 40s. <laughs> and... Uh, the doctor said, what's wrong? What, what brings you in today? And the guy, the guy held up his leg. He said, doctor, you see this, you see this little spot right here above my, my left knee? He said, yeah, I see it. And the guy goes, this is where it doesn't hurt. <laughs> I thought that's a pretty good example of how people are thinking and living right now. Hurting all over and telling you about it. Here's what's wrong. Here's what's wrong. Here's what's wrong. But have you noticed, since you walked in the doors of this place, you have not been finding out what's wrong with you? You've been finding out what's right with you? For the last two days, you've had nothing but people stand up here over and over and tell you, this is what's right with you, this is what's right with you, and this is what's right with you, and this is what's right with you. And if you will magnify what's right with you, it'll fix what's wrong with you. If you'll quit talking all the time about what's wrong and you'll focus on what's correct. This is what the Word of God does for us. Brings correction. Can you handle it if you receive some correction? Oh, eight of you can. Well, good. You're going to go far with the Lord. Quick to respond, guys. Quick to respond. He said the Word of God brings correction even a rebuke if we need it. But notice this. Why? What's this for? Verse 17. Put that up there for us. It brings, it's profitable for doctrine, approved correction, instruction, and righteousness. Verse 17. That the man of God. Who? The man of God. And if you've got a particular preacher in your mind when you read that verse... Stop it. He's talking about you. The man of God. What's the word for? Who's it profitable for? It's for the man of God that he may be complete and listen, thoroughly equipped. I got 10 minutes left and this is what I've been trying to get to for two days. Thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is what the Word and only the Word of God can do in our lives. Thoroughly equip. Anybody like the idea of um, a car that's not just moderately equipped or well equipped, but what? Fully? You ever heard that? Fully equipped. Thoroughly equipped. What's that mean? It's got everything on it. It's got everything in it. It's got the biggest engine. It's got all the sweet stuff, the bells and the whistles, and this thing will toast your buns and cool them if you need to. And I mean, everything in between. This thing is thoroughly, fully equipped, right? You know, when you get up here in the mountains, I don't know how many of you came from another state. I moved here from Texas. And I, uh, I found things uh, here that we didn't have in Texas. Um, things like outfitters. You ever heard of an outfitter? I like these stores. 
I like going in these places. We have them a lot of times in these mountain towns or you'll have them around ski resorts or any place where there's outdoor activity, you'll see an outfitter, a recreational outfitter, right? Recreational equipment. I love going into these stores and these people love it when they see me coming because I get so into this equipping. Now, I'm not a hunter. My brother-in-law is a hunter, and I've watched him. He got into this a couple years ago, and when I say he got into it, it got into him. <laughs> Am I telling the truth? Man, he was reading and studying, and the next thing you know, he's down at Shields or wherever, and he's trying bows, and he's got all the latest gear, and he's decked out head to toe in camo, and, and he went on a, what, a seven-day elk hunt by yourself, and he is loaded down. I remember just seeing him with all his gear spread across the kitchen table. This man was equipped. <laughs> I'm not much of a hunter. I do enjoy some snowboarding. We've got the men from our staff right here, and a couple of times we've gone out together, drive up to Keystone or Breckenridge, and we'll go snowboarding for the day. And I, when I go into these equipping places, I want it all. I'm not even that good at it. I just like the stuff. I like how I look in the stuff, man. I like this sweet board. This is, oh man, this is a sweet board. Remember the day I bought that board and I paid a pretty penny for that board? Oh, you must be good. Not really. <laughs> but it's a sweet piece of equipment. And I got me some K2 boots with the double boas and I got some sweet uh, goggles with interchangeable lenses and I got a nice new thing that you wear. And, and I, man, when you see me walking up to that mountain, I am equipped. I got everything I need, right? Fully, thoroughly equipped. That's what I want you to think when you think about the anointing. The anointing on you is the equipping. It's the equipment that you need to do the job you're called to do. It was the equipment Jesus needed. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good. Isn't that what he said? Uh, uh, equipped for every good work. Who went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. I'm going to say something to you. It might make you mad, but dig into the word. Jesus could not have done that without the anointing. He was totally dependent upon the Spirit in him, the Spirit on him, and the anointing. It was the equipping. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel because without it, I can't preach the gospel to the poor. It won't do anything. It won't lift a burden. It won't destroy a yoke. It's the anointing. This is what we're after, guys. And the anointing is only effective in our lives when we believe it when we expect it, when we have enough boldness and courage to say, I am anointed with the same anointing that was and is on Jesus. I'm not just a receiver of it, I'm a carrier of it. And it takes some spiritual guts to say that. Why? Because you know you and I know me. And I'm so thankful for what we've heard the last two days and we realize this is not dependent on anything other than what Jesus has done for us. Amen. Thank you, Lord. The anointing. Do you remember yesterday when we were looking at the life of Saul, King Saul, and when he came face to face with the call of God on his life, when Samuel looked at him and said, all the hope of Israel is on you, what did, what did he say? It revealed insecurity. It revealed a lack of confidence and he said, who am I that you talk to me like this? I'm the least, I'm the smallest. Why would you talk to me like this? Then and there in that moment, he was not equipped. Called, but not equipped. Can you see that? Not equipped to do this job. But when the anointing came on him, the scripture tells us he was turned into another man. And he began to prophesy, and that takes boldness, and that takes confidence. And he began to, to prophesy and yield himself to the Spirit of God. 
And when you've got time, take a look at it. Samuel even told him, when these things happen, he gave him this specific instruction, see that you do all that the occasion demands of you. That's an interesting instruction, isn't it? See that you do all that the occasion demands of you. Let me just explain it to you quickly like this. Every single day, you and I are being led into situations and places and environments that demand the anointing that's on us. You ever seen this played out in a movie or a show? Somebody's sitting in a restaurant and they, they start choking and they're pounding on their chest and they're laying on the ground dying or they're having a heart attack or something and somebody yells out what? Is there a, is there a doctor in the house? Now what if that were to happen in real life and you were to find out, yeah, there was a doctor at the next table, but he said, uh, I keep office hours Monday through Friday. Give my assistant a call. Monday morning, and I'll be happy to see you then. He's in the middle of an occasion that demands what he knows, what he has, what he's been equipped with. And what would you think of a man who failed to act in the middle of that moment and failed to use what he'd been equipped with to save somebody, to lift a burden, to destroy a yoke? I'm telling you, men, you're stepping even back into your own home. When you get home, you're stepping into an environment that demands the anointing on you. It's like our children and our wives are thirsty and crying out, is there an anointing in this house? Is there a man anointed in this house? Anointed to lead, anointed to establish, anointed to be an example. Is there a man anointed in this house? You're being equipped. Glory to God. Right now with the word of God, you're being equipped, fully equipped. Jesus was never short of equipment. When he ran into sickness, when he ran into disease, when he ran into death itself, he was fully equipped to lift the burden, to destroy the yoke. Glory to God. And the scripture even tells us that God gave, these are his gifts to men. You remember what they are? That five-fold ministry? Prophets, apostles, apostles, evangelists, pastors, teachers. He said he gave these gifts unto men and he gave us the reason for it. For the equipping of the saints. For the work of the ministry. Too many people said God gave these gifts for the work of the ministry. No. He gave these gifts to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. This is not something that's relegated to a man or a woman who stands on a platform behind a pulpit or a podium. This is you and your anointing. It's what you are being equipped with, glory to God. And every time we sit under the anointed word, we should be looking for more equipping, equipping, equipping. Can I give you a really good biblical example of this? You know how just before James Bond, um, goes out on a mission. What's the last scene in every one of the movies? Brother Andrew, you won't know this. You've been saved your whole life. But um, what's the last scene before he goes out on the mission? He goes to Q. I heard it. He goes to Q, Q branch, right? And he, he, he meets with Q and going all the way back to the first movies with the James Bond, Sean Connery. What's he do? He equips him. He gives him the equipment. Here's a shoe that's got a bomb in it or whatever. Here's, here's a piece of gum that will explode a door. Here's and, and he, one thing after another, after another, after another. Here's a car that will fly and he, all this stuff. He's getting equipped. But what do those scenes tell us about what's coming? Here in just a few minutes, Mr. Bond's going to need this shoe that'll blow this guy's head off, or he's going to need this piece of gum that can get him in this door, or he's going to need this car that's got bullets, and right? The equipping is the foreshadowing of what he's about to need. Every time, whether you're in a place like this one right now, or in your own home church, 
I said, in your own home church. I said, in the church that you are faithful to and you go to and you lead your family to and you set the example that these things are priority to us in our lives and we are a part of a church and we're serving in a church and we're sowing in a church. Okay? Every time you sit under the word there, you're being equipped. And instead of sleeping through the message, we should be thinking, I'm about to need this. I'm being equipped with the weaponry that I'm about to need. I don't know if it's later today, Monday, Tuesday, later this week, a year from now, but thank you, Lord, for the equipment. He's equipping us. And the the, the equipment he's given us, part of that is that anointing that's on your life that will turn you into another man. And I don't know if you realize this or not, but that is exactly what you saw last night. When Todd came out here last night, it was like out of the gate. You ever seen a bull (laughs) that's about to be ridden? And the second they open that gate, there's no warm up. He's just on. Did you notice that last night? No warm up. It was power from the word go. But my son, Justice, he's here with me, and he was here last night, he's 13. And he leaned over to me and he goes, he was so quiet at dinner. (laughs) And he was, we had dinner together last night. I'm sorry, I'm taking just another, a couple extra minutes, I apologize, but I want you to see this. We had dinner together last night, it was a privilege to sit there with Brother Andrew and Todd and Colin and, and Jordan and just fellowshipping with each other. And Todd was, So tender, so peaceful, so quiet. It's almost like the anointing can turn you into another man. Brother Hagen, who many of you know and remember, he used to say this. He never personally witnessed Smith Wigglesworth's ministry. Todd mentioned him last night. But he knew a man who did. And the man he knew was the head of the Assemblies of God denomination over their uh, ministry school in England. And though Smith was not a part of their group or their denomination, this man would invite Smith Wigglesworth to come teach the young men in their ministry school, the school of men. And he would invite him, though he was from outside the group, to come teach these young men. And he did it on purpose. He said every time he would come, you know, Smith was an uneducated guy, just like Todd was talking about last night, never read a book. Smith couldn't read. First book he ever read was the Bible. And it's like he would stand up there and this man said, you know, honestly, from the moment he stood up, it was a little awkward. He was hard to follow. He really couldn't put two sentences together. You could kind of tell he was uneducated. He said, but I would bring him because without fail, every time there came a moment, once he was into his message, he said the anointing would come on him. So much so that it would startle people. Because he would go from stuttering, really unable to talk and communicate, and in a second, the anointing would hit and he would say, if the Spirit of God, the same Spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he will quicken you, quicken you, quicken you, quicken your mortal body, quicken you. And the power of God would hit him. And this this is the reason this man would invite him to come. He wanted these ministers to see what happened to somebody under this anointing. Transformed right in front of them. And he said they would just... And this man said about Smith Wigglesworth, it was like he was another person. That's what the anointing does. It's the transformative power of the anointing. Amen? Amen. Stand on your feet with me. We know Jesus was and is anointed. We know Peter was and is anointed. Paul, right? Andrew, and this one. We all know men and women of God who have spoken the word to us in our lives. We've all been receivers and recipients of that anointing. You are leaving here today, carriers of it. The burden removing, yoke destroying power of God. You're a carrier of it. And I encourage you to ask the Lord to show you when it comes on you in a special way. When it comes on you 
And you step into an occasion that demands it. Whether it's in your home or in your office or somewhere else, it demands. Is there, is there a man anointed in the house? You step up with confidence. Glory to God. Father, I pray right now over every man in this building today, those watching online, those who will watch this later, I'm asking you, Lord, to open the eyes of our understanding that we would see and know the hope of our calling and, Lord, what you have equipped us with to do what you've called us to do. Thank you for not leaving us uh, equipmentless to try to do this on our own strength, under our own might, but you've given us your Holy Spirit, you've given us your power, you've given us the anointing. Oh, we thank you for it. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Lord. I'll leave you with this last thought. We were laughing about Samson earlier. But everybody's got a picture of Samson in their mind, right? Six foot 10, 380 pounds of pure muscle. But if you read his story, there's not one reference to his phys physical stature. You know what you do read five times? The Spirit of the Lord came on him. The Spirit of the Lord came on him. The Spirit of the Lord came on him. And what I'm saying to you, I think I can prove it. They had to get a harlot to go in there and say, find out where his strength comes from. I think if he was naturally strong, nobody would have said, go find out. They're trying to figure out, where does he get this? I got to tell you, this revelation helps guys like me. <laughs> the anointing, the spirit of the Lord coming on him. In my mind, Samson was this. <laughs> Why not? But he was a man anointed. So are you. Did you get something good out of this? Yeah. Praise the Lord.